Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rory Love, and I'm a lawyer with Strigberger Brown and Armstrong. I joined the firm in April of this year, and I'm looking forward to present at my first webinar. My practice is primarily tort based, but the firm, which was founded in January 2018, um, offers accident benefits services as well as coverage work, and we have offices across Toronto, Kitchener, and London. If you have any questions today, um, please go into the Q&A button, which should be at the bottom of your screen, and put your question in, and I'd be happy to answer those at the end of the webinar. Uh, as a reminder, this webinar is recorded and can be accessed at our website after today's date if you want to circulate it around any members of your team. If any of you do want copies of my slides from today, I'd be happy to share with those. Please just contact me directly and I'll be happy to send those over to you. So with mental health coming to the forefront of many of our lives in the past few years, particularly triggered by the COVID lockdowns, I'm going to discuss today the Court of Appeal um, decision in Bothwell versus London Health Services, where the Court of Appeal considered whether persistent feelings of anger and frustration um, quantifies as a mental health injury and is subject to any damages payments. Now, there is a long history, um, particularly with two landmark cases with mental injury. Many of you will know Mustafa versus Culligan, and there's also the decision in Sedati. Um, both of these decisions from 2008 and 2017 created the framework for which the decision in Bothwell was ultimately decided. I'm going to begin by going over Mustaf and Sadati cases before delving into this most recent 2023 case. So many of you will be familiar with the Mustafa case, and it particularly springs to mind as being the fly in the water case. It's also particularly well known as being a case that provided a, a very detailed analysis for remoteness, but it also makes some key comments on the threshold for me mental injury claims. Now, just a little bit of background before I get into some detailed background. Mr. Mustafa and his wife replaced a water dispenser at their home. Um, as they did, they observed uh, one full dead fly and part of another dead fly inside the replacement water bottle. When Mrs. Mustafa spotted the flies, she vomited, and Mr. Mustafa also became nauseous and complained of abdominal pains. As a result of seeing the fly and the part of the fly in the water bottle, he became depressed, had phobias and developed anxiety, and he essentially argued that seeing the fly and part of the fly in the water ruined his life. He complained of being unable to drink coffee and even allegedly developed a fear of drowning in water. Um, as a result of the fly and the part of the fly in the water bottle, the plaintiff claimed for damages for psychological injury. Now, just a little bit more specific detail about Mr. Mustafa. Uh, he was a Lebanese immigrant who came to Canada in 1976. He was a hairdresser and operated a salon called Martin's Coiffure and Spa in Windsor. And he opened that in 1986 and he had three locations in, to in total. The Mustafas um, were very keen on their hygiene and health and they decided that they wanted to start consuming Culligan water, um, which they believed would provide additional health benefits in comparison to regular city water. Um, the water dispensers of Culligan were installed in the salon and their home, and they had used um, Culligan water for 15 years before the subject fly incident. Now, um, this went to trial and the court addressed specifically compensable mental injury and held that Mr. Mustafa's complaints were serious and prolonged and rose above that of the ordinary emotional disturbances that will occasionally afflict any members of civil society without violating their right to be free of negligently caused mental injury. Now, Mr. Mustafa was quite successful at trial, and you'll see here um, that the court found that Culligan was negligent 
and they ultimately awarded Mr. Mustafa 80,000 in general damages, um, just over 24,000 in special damages, and a hefty sum for loss of business income of 237,600. Now, Culligan um, appealed this to the Court of the Appeal, which overturned the trial decision on the basis that Mr. Mustafa's reaction to the dead fly was not reasonably foreseeable and did not give him a right to receive damages. Now, Mr. Mustafa appealed this to the Supreme Court of Canada, and he had his appeal dismissed. So in finding in favour of Culligan, the court stated that the plaintiff's reaction to the fly in the bottle was abnormal, product of his particular hypersensitivity and was not the response of the average sensitive person. They went even further um, and were quite critical of Mr. Mustafa and said that his reaction was not the response of a person of reasonable fortitude and robustness. Now, the Court of Appeal clarified that a duty of care will only be found where the harm is reasonably foreseeable. As I mentioned before, this case does delve quite deeply into foreseeability. Um, and that to determine whether the harm was foreseeable, there needed to be proximate, proximity sorry, to the relationship between the parties and the probability of any harm occurring. And the court found that the trial judge erred in considering whether there was a foreseeable possibility of damage and that the court's reliance on the test of possibility and not probability was the error. As a result, in mental health cases, the question should be whether it would be reasonably foreseeable to a defendant that a person of normal fortitude of sensibility is likely to suffer some type of psychiatric harm as a consequence of the defendant's careless action. Now, the Supreme Court did comment on a threshold for actionable mental harm, and it stated that the distinction between physical and mental injury is elusive and arguably artificial in the context of tort. They also noted that the distinction should exist between psychological disturbance that rises to the level of personal injury, and it must be distinguished from psychological upset, um, which we'll get into in the, the um, next cases, how important that is in this test. Further, the court confirmed the law does not recognize upset, disgust, anxiety, agitation, or other mental states that fall short of injury. Now, I'm going to get into the Sadati case, which many consider the leading case on proving mental injury claims. In Sadati, the court expressly stated that mental injury must be treated in the same manner as physical injury, which again is a very important takeaway from this trilogy of cases. Um, now, in this case, the Supreme Court stated that the plaintiff does not need to show that their mental injury is a recognized psychiatric illness. And they specifically stated that claimants must therefore show much more than the disturbance suffered by the claimant. And it is serious and prolonged and rises above the ordinary annoyances, anxieties, and fears that come with living in civil society. And ultimately, the claimant's task is to establish a mental injury and show the requisite degree of disturbance. They also further stated, in assessing whether the claimant has succeeded, it will often be important to consider how seriously the claimant's cognitive functions and participation in daily activities are impaired, the length of such impairment, and the nature and effect of any treatment that the plaintiff may have received. To the extent that the claimants do not adduce relevant expert evidence to assess triers of fact in applying these and other relevant considerations, they run the risk of being found to have fallen short. Um, and expert evidence, as I'll discuss, um, is also a very contentious issue within this type of action. The Sadati also held that it's not necessary for the plaintiff to adduce expert opinion, as I mentioned, and that any evidence from a lay witness can be sufficient. Now, some background about the Sadati case. Um, so in July 2005, Mr. Sadati was involved in a car accident with Mr. Moorhead. 
Um, the 2005 accident was the second of five motor vehicle accidents that he had had from 2003 to 2009. When they attended at the 2005 accident, paramedics noticed that he, whilst um, Mr. Sadati was emotionally shaken by the accident, he didn't have any injuries that necessitated him being brought to hospital. Um, ultimately, Mr. Moorhead actually admitted liability for the accident, but they argued that the um, plaintiff didn't suffer any compensable injuries as a result of the accident. So the plaintiff, as a result of the accident, sought general damages and an income loss claim for his physical and psychological injuries. Now, expert evidence was brought um, to argue that the plaintiff had sus not sustained a concussion in the accident. And it was found that he didn't suffer a head injury, and but he did suffer psychological injury, which led to cognitive difficulties and a significant personality change. Now, the courts relied on the testimony of the plaintiff's friends and family, um, including his ex-wife, who stated that because of the accident, the plaintiff began to have mood swings and he was not as active, happy, cheerful, outgoing, and a very nice man that he was before the accident. As a result, his relationships had deteriorated over time. Um, specifically, the court relied on a decision in Clements versus Clements, another Supreme Court decision, where the court held that a trial judge is to take a robust and pragmatic approach to determining if a plaintiff has established that the defendant's negligence caused them loss and scientific proof of the causation is not required. Ultimately, at trial, Mr. Sadati was awarded $100,000 in general damages. Now, this matter went to the BC Court of Appeal, um, who overturned the trial judge's decision and determined that Mr. Sadati um, did not prove that he'd suffered a medically recognizable psychiatric or psychological illness or condition that would entitle him to award for damages for this type of accident. Um, they also relied on a case called Odhavji versus Woodhouse, and they stated that damages for psychiatric um, injuries are available where the plaintiff suffers from visible and provable illness or a recognizable physical or psychological harm. So the plaintiff's understanding of the Mustafa test was rejected because the plaintiff had relied on Mustafa as a president, removing any requirement to prove the recognizable psychiatric condition. And um, ultimately this matter was appealed by the plaintiff to the Supreme Court where um, it was rejected um, the, the Court of Appeals perspective of mental injury, and they stated that you did not need a recognizable physical psychiatric illness as a precondition to recover for mental injury. And they expressed specifically at paragraph two that the process for assessing psychological injury must be the same as that for a physical injury. And they stated, just as recovery for physical injury is not as a matter of law conditioned upon claimant adducing expert diagnostic evidence and support, recovery for mental injury does not require proof of a recognizable psychiatric injury. Now, in rejecting that need for proof of a recognized psychiatric illness, the court held that the Mustafa test provided sufficient protections against the potential of worthless claims which could come from mental injury. And in Sadati, the court used the threshold asserted in Mustafa that any mental injury has to be serious and prolonged, and it rises above the ordinary emotional disturbances that will occasionally afflict any member of civil society without violating his or her right to be free and negligently cause mental injury. So this is the threshold reference in Sadati um, that not all disturbances will amount to damages that qualifies mental injury and emphasize that the threshold is a matter of a degree of disturbance that does not require a recognizable psychiatric injury. It was noted in Sadati, um, it, it went into quite a 
big analysis of um, the specifics of diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders, or as affectionately known as DSM, which stipulates that diagnostic criteria for mental disorders should not be wholly replied on, relied on, as I mentioned. So at paragraph 31 of the decision, um, it stated that confining compensable mental injury conditions that are identifiable with reference to these diagnostic tools is inherently suspect as a matter of legal methodology. While for treatment purposes, an accurate diagnosis is obviously important, a trier of fact adjudicating a claim of mental injury is not concerned with diagnosis, but with symptoms and their effects. And the court held that entitlement to damages is based on the level of harm that the claimant's particular symptoms represent. And whilst not imposing a corresponding requirement upon claimants alleging physical injury to show that their condition carries a certain classifactory label, would accord unequal protection to victims of mental injury. So quite progressive for a 2017 decision where mental health injury maybe wasn't um, at such the forefront of the thoughts of courts and people alike. So the court acknowledged, as I mentioned, um, the analysis on expert evidence that it can be assistance in determining whether a plaintiff has a diagnosed psychological injury it held, more importantly, that expert evidence is not required as a matter of law. Where psychiatric illness has not been formally diagnosed, it remains open to the trier fact to find on other evidence adduced by the claimant that he or she is proven on the balance of probabilities and occurrence of mental injury, and that this case relied heavily, as I mentioned, on Mr. Sadati's lay witnesses that spoke to the significant change in his demeanor as a result of this accident. So ultimately, the Supreme Court accepted the trial judge's decision that the testimonial evidence confirmed that Mr. Sadati had suffered psychological injury and restored his $100,000 um, non pecuniary damages award. So now I'm going to move into the recent case of Bothell um, that's released um, about a month ago now. So Bothell arises from an incident where Mr. Bothell was provided the wrong medication when he attended at hospital. Uh, when he discovered the error, Mr. Bothell became angry and frustrated and he brought a claim for mental injury. Now, the Court of Appeal um, reviewed the test for proving mental injury as framed in the Sadati case. And it was ultimately decided that Mr. Bothell's feelings of anger and frustration were not evidence of a psychological injury, but were only psychological upset. And they specifically held that in the absence of any evidence of impairment of cognitive functioning, obstruction with the activities of daily living or treatment for emotional symptoms, a claim for mental injury can't be successful. Now, Mr. Bothwell attended at the London Health Sciences Centre and specifically Victoria Hospital. Um, he was there to get a surgery for his Crohn disease. While he recovered, his blood pressure dropped and the doctor ordered Volovin, which is a blood volumizer. A nurse accidentally gave him a drug called Heparin, which is an anticoagulant, excuse my pronunciation, um, and the issue with the medication led to internal bleeding and further surgeries and a variety of additional treatment were required. When Mr. Bothwell woke up from his surgery, he heard someone ask if the volovin had been given, and then he heard words to the effect of that's bleep heparin. Um, as a paramedic, Mr. Bothwell knew that heparin could cause um, significant bleeding. He blacked out and awoke up. Um, sometime later, and his wife and other members of his family were there. He experienced shortness of breath and became very hot, and he was sedated and incubated. Short time later, Mr. Bothwell underwent further surgeries to relieve the abnormal, abdominal cavity pressure because of substantial internal bleeding. Um, his wife also brought a family law action and Mr. Bothwell and his wife claimed damages as a result of Mr. Bothwell 
I'm allegedly suffering injuries to his internal organs, digestive issues, neurologic injury, weakness, muscle wasting, sensory loss, nightmares, and aggravation of his Crohn disease. And in terms of a, a mental injury perspective, anxiety, depression, and a general psychological injury. Um, this is important to know that Mr. Bothell and his wife were both paramedics and they had two uh, young children and their eldest was born at the time of the medication error. Now at trial, the judge ruled that the nurse and the hospital breached their duty by administering heparin to Mr. Bothell and the judge concluded that the causation requirement and between breach and Mr. Bothwell's psychological upset met the standard as described in Sadati. And Mr. Bothwell's feelings were objectively and subjectively serious and went beyond ordinary annoyances. Um, in this case, it's quite important to note that the um, plaintiff didn't bring any expert psychological evidence and everything was relied on from a lay witness perspective. Um, now, this matter was interesting in that it bifurcated the trial. There was going to be an analysis of the physical injuries and in that causation, and then they were going to also discover damages and the psychological upset. Um, so at the first trial, it was noted based on expert um, evidence that the medication error did not cause the hemorrhage that um, Mr. Bothwell suffered, um, and then they went into the analysis and, and the second decision about the medication error. Um, the trial judge accepted that Mr. Bothwell's evidence, he was frustrated and angry about the medication error. And it was accepted that these occurred because he attended at the hospital and that he was a paramedic and that this would trigger his regular attendances when he was working. They found him reliable and sincere and that he didn't exaggerate about the symptoms that he had suffered. And it was ultimately decided that a duty of care was owed to Mr. Bothwell um, and that he was cognizant and careful not to confuse nor conflate the erroneous administration of medication, which extended to stay in the hospital and recovery. So the court made a real emphasis of separating the physical injury um, opposed to the mental injury. Now, damages weren't assessed because the liability decision was released and then ultimately it was appealed to the Court of Appeal by the defendants. And the Court of Appeal's analysis relied heavily on the Sedati decision. So they made it clear that the trier of fact must consider all of the Sedati factors and the failure to do so would be an error in law. Now, in considering the Sedati factors, the Court of Appeal found no evidence of impairment from the medication error. The plaintiff continued to work after the error. Um, he maintained a good relationship with his family, and he actually didn't seek any psychological treatment at all following these um, alleged symptoms that he suffered. And he stated that the case was in contrast to Sedati because Mr. Sadati had experienced personality changes, mood swings, and headaches, which affected his relationships and family and with his family and friends that I previously discussed. The court in this appeal decision, they reiterated that to prove mental injury, you do not have to demonstrate that the condition meets the threshold of a recognizable psychiatric illness. But they must show mental injury has suffered a serious and prolonged rise above the ordinary annoyances, anxieties and fears that come with living in civil society that I previously quoted. Now, they found that the trial judge had failed to consider the degree of disturbance to Mr. Bothwell experienced due to the psychological upset, and that failure to consider the lack of impact in Mr. Bothwell's life was um, an error. Um, the Court of Appeal stated that the Sedati provided clear direction the when distinguished between mental injury and psychological upset, the trier of fact has to consider the claimant's upset as well as the seriousness of the impairment and the level of the treatment. Um, and whilst the plaintiffs and the trial judge had um, referenced the correct principles, they failed to recognize Sadati in the Bothell case required that above the considerations there has to be a determination of whether the claimant succeeded in showing a mental injury. 
Interestingly, the Court of Appeal clarified that the gravity of an experience, even a near-death experience, can be relevant but it remains an issue whether the claimant's persistent feelings following an incident meet the requisite degree of disturbance to be compensable mental injury. And ultimately, they concluded the feelings of anger and frustration without any more are evidence of upset and not injury. And they stated, in the absence of evidence of impairment of cognitive functioning, interference with activities of daily living or treatment for emotional symptoms, the claim for mental injury cannot succeed, and as such, Mr. Bothell's claim didn't succeed. Now, what are the key takeaways from this trilogy of cases? Now, I guess the most important one is not all injuries are physical and easy to identify, which I think we all know from handling claims. Because mental, mental injuries aren't objectified and extremely subjective, they're very difficult to prove. Um, the Bothell case helps clarify that a plaintiff still has the evidentiary burden to prove that they have feelings of anger, frustration and sadness that are compensable psychological injuries and they're entitled to damages. Now in Sadati, the Supreme Court emphasized that any court that's looking into a claim for mental injury shouldn't be concerned with diagnosis, but focus on the symptoms that the plaintiff is suffering. And specifically, um, they should target the level of harm that the, the plaintiff's symptoms represent. In Sedati, they set out the three-pronged factor of how mental injury claims are to be assessed and awarded, and that is how seriously the claimant's cognitive functions and participation in daily activities are impaired, the length of the impairment, and the nature and effect of any treatment sought. The decision also makes it clear that the mental injuries are to be treated like physical injuries, as I said, and that it's not necessary for a claimant to prove a recognized mental injury using expertise as a requirement to obtain damages. I think, again, a really important takeaway from this. Um, special attention should be paid to lay witnesses. And as the decision in Sadati represents, um, lay witness evidence can be extremely important, and that decision was um, founded completely on lay witness information. So in terms of um, um, some strategies that we can implement for that, I think undertakings for lay witnesses at discoveries should actually be pursued, and those witnesses should be contacted on behalf of the claims team. Um, the defense shouldn't underestimate information that a lay witness may have, particularly from a social and employment perspective. I mean, not any non-family members where they might be prepared to give less um, subjective and biased opinions on the plaintiff's injuries. Now, when mental injury is alleged, negligence still has to be um, proven in terms of a duty of care on to the defendant, uh, by sorry, to the plaintiff by the defendant, a breach of that duty, and then resulting harm from that. So the basic tort principle shouldn't be forgotten in amongst all the nuances of mental injury. Um, and as mentioned, while expert evidence can assist in determining when or not mental injury has been shown, that evidence is not required um, it can still be of assistance to defence and plaintiffs alike and shouldn't just be abandoned because the case law does not require it. And the courts have indicated that it can be helpful in determining whether the plaintiff has proven a mental injury. And as such, from a defence perspective, we would want to uh, disprove that. The court has stated that the expert evidence can also be important in terms of assessing the seriousness of the plaintiff's symptoms, the duration of the impairment, and ultimately the nature of the effect of any treatment that the plaintiff might receive. We could also use expert evidence in order to um, clarify whether the alleged negligent conduct um, would lead to a foreseeable injury for the plaintiff and the claimant's symptoms shouldn't necessarily amount to what we should be considered to a prolonged disruption in their life and a mental injury if they haven't even breached that negligence um, that they allege by the defendants. Now, I know we've just finished close to the end, um, so perhaps any questions that anybody may have, you can direct to me 
um, personally, my email was on the first slide. And um, thank you again for listening. And it was